And we are recording. All right. Another episode of Square and Compass podcast, this time going over to the uh, West Coast, which I haven't had a chance to, to uh, interview anybody from yet. Worshipful brother Ben Stagner of University Lodge in Seattle, Washington. Thank you so much for joining. Thanks for having me. So uh, before we go any further, I just got to do a quick shout out, uh, remind any Masons or non-Masons watching this in Windsor or Essex, Square and Compass Promotions is sponsoring a blood drive December 30th, 31st and 1st. I'll put the, um, the flyer up on the screen, but if you donate blood or you've always thought about it, now's your chance. You donate on any of those days, you're eligible to win a scale model of the Masonic Temple, some Christmas stockings, uh, you know, with COVID-19, the need for blood is still there. And Canadian Blood Services is doing a great job trying to keep, uh, keeping the process super safe. I've done it a bunch of times since the outbreak. So yeah, if you get a chance, please uh, sign up and donate blood and you could win a prize. And with that, Worshipful Sir, thank you so much. <laughs> no, thanks again for having me. Right on. So, I came across University Lodge through Facebook. Um, there was an invitation to join your virtual happy hour, which I took part in and it was a blast. Though I'm concerned, you know, I looked on your website, you guys say you're the thinking man's lodge and I'm kind of an idiot, so I don't know. <laughs> I'll need you to do the thinking for both of us. Oh, geez. <laughs> well, it, it's funny you should bring that, that specifically up. Um, it is a thinking man's lodge. Uh, it's a block away from the University of Washington. Um, but it's kind of, it's one of those deals where I think can intimidate some people as far as, I mean, we have a library. It does get very, um, definitely intellectually stimulating um, and very academic. Uh, but one, one of the things that I really like, especially this year, is to kind of steer more towards not so much having to be deal with a research academic point of view, but more of just a discussion where, what does it mean to learn? How do you, how, what kind of, what, what is knowledge and does it have to be from a book? And I, I, I think it can be, from sharing perspectives, learning perspectives. And that's one of the great things I love about masonry is the ability to share perspectives. And I think that's been the focus of this year. So thank you, Man's Lodge. Not always having to, not, not always has to do with books. You no know, perspectives is such, yeah, that's a good place to, to, to talk about. You know, one thing I love about the podcast format or just, you know, the benefits of social media, we all know that there's dangers to it, but the benefits is you're able to gather perspectives uh, from, you know, in this case, Seattle, Washington to, uh, you know, I've, I've interviewed brethren uh, from all over the States, all over Canada, Manitoba, uh, up North. So just, yeah, sharing perspectives that you might not normally get a chance to, to learn from think is is definitely a cool thing and it sounds like it's something that you guys in university lodge really try to emphasize i think so yeah it, and, and it's it is the opportunity for growth in that especially right now um especially in, in unity i think is, is starting to kind of rear its head a little bit more and start to gain a little bit more traction right now and i think that's that's really important especially in sharing perspective sharing somebody else's point of view learning their background and one thing I do like about the brothers in my lodge is they, they constantly say, like, these are people that I, I don't think, honestly, I, I would really talk to or hang out with on, in any other situation because this, the opportunity to meet somebody wouldn't be there unless it were for in the lodge. You, uh, you're in an interesting position, as are all of the Worshipful Masters. So you became Worshipful Master in November of last year. Mm -hmm. November. So November, December, I believe it was November. So you've basically been a worshipful master for the entirety of, you know, the current situation. Um, and I'm not sure what type of steps they took in Washington in terms of public health measures and lockdowns. Uh, but, you know, every state and in Canada, every province has been dealing with it differently. But Freemasonry, you know, every Grand Lodge, every lodge has been trying to you know, navigate very uncharted territories, at least in our lifetimes. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what, you, as a worshipful master, how did you view your role, you know, pre, pre COVID and, and currently, how did you view, do you view it as you kind of have the same role or 
what type of things did you try to do to help navigate the lodge? Um, well, my plans immediately went uh, out the window because I had a completely different plan for the year. I mean, uh, the plan was to have a lot of social gatherings, uh, a lot of discussions, a lot of stuff. I, I, my, I had developed a or put together a, a little lecture about the working tools, but using uh, tattoo equipment because I tattoo for a living using tattoo equipment instead of the, the working tools that we use in masonry. I had, I had created my own working tools using uh, tattoo equipment. And I was excited. I got to visit. I think I, I think I made it up to about three different lodges, uh, given that going and visiting, traveling, giving that, that that speech. And I was that was kind of the plan and having people come to our lodge and do the same thing, uh, which, of course, was not conducive after COVID did hit. Uh, the uh, the Grand Lodge did shut down all the lodges for everyone's safety, which I completely 100 percent back up. Uh, so I think it, it was definitely cause for some reflection as far as what my role is in the East, what it can mean. Um, I mean, I know on some days, some, some days a month, it's nice to just go to lodge, open lodge, do business, close lodge and go home. <laughs> but in this case, I think there's much more, okay, we need to do something. What does that mean? And I think we're still able to have a little, um, uh, sorry, um, <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, we're still able to have, have discussions, uh, different subjects. Uh, we have our brother Adam Alsobrook put on a, um, a program about the history of our lodge, which goes way back to 1908. Uh, it's highly detailed uh, and, and doing the happy hours. I think that was a really big thing, too, uh, to be able to get people still connecting, getting us still together um, and then helping other brothers out. That was a big thing. Right when it started was we were trying to figure out. Like who's our brothers who, who won't be able to get groceries or who are, who are the ones most susceptible if they take a step outside their house. And so we called up all of our older brothers to see who, who we could help out. So I, it, the work didn't, didn't go down by any means. It just changed. But the motivation, I believe, was still there. I, I, like, I like kind of the way you describe it. One thing that I've been trying to emphasize to... Uh, my lodge and, and Masons in general in Ontario. I'm the secretary of my affiliated lodge and past master of my mother lodge is that, um, you know, there's a difference between, a lot of times you'll hear people say, or Masons say that, you know, Masonic activity has been suspended in Ontario until mm -hmm. right now, January 31st. But I always point out that, you know, in-person Masonic meetings may have been suspended, which is obviously a major part of our activity, but Masonic activity itself is still going on, whether that be benevolence requests are still being answered if a brother needs assistance because they're out of work, or we have volunteers delivering food, as you pointed, same thing in Seattle. Um, you know, correspondence is going out, there's online meetings, so there's still Masonic activity. Absolutely. It's just being creative, and like you said, finding ways to make... Uh, finding ways to make it work under challenging circumstances. Yeah, absolutely. And even the stuff that you see on social media, I think this is a, a time when we can see with all the quarantining and people being inside, seeing what people do to get creative. Like how can that not be motivating to, to, to take that and translate into how, how we could do things with our lodge. Yeah. Where do you, where do you, where's your opinion on social media and Freemasonry? Because there's always, it, just in general, do you think that it's it's a benefit, that it can be harmful? I guess, where do you fall on, on using social media, both before the pandemic and once this is all done and currently? I mean, social media is absolutely, <laughs> when it first came out, I don't think it was developed to just watch cat videos and, you know, put on Yelp reviews. <laughs> um, I think it can be used as a great tool. I think it was originally intended to be a great tool. Um, I, I think with anything, people, you know, it, it goes through its transitions of what it what it represents, what it means. But but underlyingly, if you want to use it as a great tool to connect and, and communicate with people, it is absolutely great for doing that. Uh, but like with any uh, gathering, whether it be in a lodge or whether it be over social media, uh, in a chat room or over a forum, uh, I think mediation is still a, a very important aspect of that. Um, like our last happy hour, it's kind of a joke when I posted on Facebook, but it, there was some seriousness when I put on the very bottom, no religion, no politics. Um, I think because again, there's a reason we, we, 
we don't have those in the lodge, I think, because it makes a much more open, neutral uh, place to be able to share who we are without needing to, you know, have these two things in the background that can kind of make things a little more complicated when it comes to just connecting. Um, I think social media, yeah, it, it, it can definitely use as a great tool, um, but there's a responsibility to it, just like with anything else, whether it be like a newspaper or a magazine, um, there's a responsibility to keep the, keep the spirit of what your, your goal is a current and alive in there. And then how do you, how would you balance out? Cause I know something I, in, you know, I think every lodge struggles with in terms of, or just Mason's general is, you know, when it's a lodge sanctioned so event, virtual event, virtual happy hour or something, you know, the, the lodge develops, there's a level of, of control over, or you can kind of set ground rules, but you know, we, the, the no politics, I've talked about this with a few different guests, the, the no politics, no, um, no religion, that obviously doesn't apply to Masons in their personal lives. Of course, so yeah. it can be, you'll see Masons posting political things or religious things on their own time and other Masons sees it. You know, you hear these stories about these battles happening on social media outside of lodge events or lodge activities. I guess, what are your views on, especially now, because we're using it so much more with the dynamic, I've noticed the emphasis on connect, connecting through social media is growing. I guess, what, what are your views on, on how Masons can conduct themselves on social media outside of, of Lodge? Do you think Grand Lodges should step in with some rules? Obviously, we're, we're free to do what we want, but guidelines or recommendations? I think, I mean, I, I follow the, the, the Freemason, uh, proud to be a Freemason Facebook page, and there's definitely a, a lot of opinions being shared on there. Um, and I think whether or not they're Masonic is, that, that, I think, <laughs> it can get pretty intense from what I've seen. Um, and I do believe I've, I've definitely seen some, I don't believe, some opinions that I don't feel are exactly Masonic, but again, that's, whoever's running the page, there's a responsibility there um, to maintain that. And, and if you have bigger members, it does make the job harder, but there's still, that's still a responsibility that needs to be done. However, I would say we have so much growing going on within the Masons. Numbers are picking up and people from different backgrounds are joining the Masons. And it's, it's not what it used to be where I think um, a lot of lodges, most of the people in there came from the same background, came from very similar perspectives. So it was a lot easier to agree on the same thing. And so there wasn't quite as much uh, butting of heads um, that you see a lot nowadays. And I don't, I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing, but again, it, it means we need to step up the responsibility of how do we treat those who are different from us? Um, and as a Mason, I think we have the tools to create an open conversation to have a neutral platform to to connect but just like with anything else it, it it's going to take time to to kind of find that balance i think um and those in the east those who are officers those who are going to take on a leadership role within the masons even if they're not in a chair i think this is an opportunity to to steer the conversation in the right direction um we don't, I don't, I wouldn't say the Grand Lodge needs, needs, to, needs to govern Facebook pages or social media. Um, I think maybe give their opinion and maybe give a statement as far as, you know, again, reminding the brothers what our responsibility is. Um, we brothers, we, we can talk about religion and politics together outside of Lodge. And I think that's, I think that's important to do for the sake of growth. But again, like, can I talk to my brother? Can we agree to disagree? Can we, can we agree to admit when we're changing our mind about something or, or need to know a little something more without needing to, it, it doesn't have to feel like an attack or like I'm, I'm admitting I'm wrong. Therefore I'm, my opinion is invalid. We're growing and that's, what's important. And that's what we need to understand about our, our brothers who we may not agree with or come from different backgrounds from, I believe. During your, your answer, you mentioned numbers 
going up, that it's a, a growing fraternity. Do you have any thoughts as to, to where you think that growth is coming from? What it is about the last couple of years that has seemed to encourage um, men to, to become interested once again in, in the craft? Certainly we're nowhere near you know, the golden age of the 1920s or the 1950s when you mm -hmm. saw those were kind of the periods where, where at least in Canada um, and to understand the States where you, you saw a real acceleration in growth uh, yeah. followed by, you know, a steep decline over the past several decades. But you have started to see, as you mentioned, an increase again. Uh, do you have any thoughts as to what that could be, be caused by? Is there something you think maybe men are missing in modern society that Freemasonry offers? Um, I think uh, I think the numbers are going up because the, the tie or the uh, I mean definitely some of the books that get a little creative and colorful with what Masons are I think has has kind of sparked some interest in it for sure um, but I think what it kind of boils down to as far as the numbers going up and, and staying uh, I think has to do with the, the different kind of brothers or different kind of men who are approaching Masonry with interest um, I don't think you find a Mason in the, in the, in the usual spot you used to 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago. Um, I know like after world war II, there's a lot of soldiers that came back and to, to continue that, 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 uh, spirit of brotherhood. Uh, that was, that was a perfect transition from back into the States. Um, and I think that was definitely a big reason why the numbers went up. Uh, I think if, if I had, as yeah, as it had had gone down, I think that an idea of what masonry was was maybe not quite on point. Maybe it needed to grow a little bit, and I think now this is that growth that we're seeing. Um, I never expected to. <laughs> I'll be honest; I didn't expect to be become a mason myself when I first stepped into a lodge. I did not. I didn't. I thought I was completely out of place. I mean, you you walk in covered in tattoos and 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 you go into what's lodge. The, and uh, how's that going on? What's the story there? You uh, what what brought you first walking into a lodge? Uh, it was a fez actually <laughs> uh i bought a uh, fez and just so happened to be a shriner fez for a halloween costume and actually another tattoo artist who was a freemason saw me wearing it a colleague of mine from a different shop saw me wearing it uh tracked me down and was asking oh are you a brother and i didn't know what he was talking about and he goes oh yeah well the hat actually belongs to the shriners this organization that i'm a part of and that's how i learned about it and the more he talked about it the more interested i became and uh, looked it more into it, wound up at University Lodge for dinner. And uh, yeah, the, the moment I walked in there, um, yeah, it was, it was, I wasn't sure how I would be received. And I couldn't have been more pleasantly surprised. Uh, everybody there was just extremely welcoming. They were, hey, what's your name? What do you do? Oh, you tattoo? That's great. I had a, a really goofy mustache that a few of the other brothers had, and I immediately got introduced to them and started chatting about mustaches. It was so welcoming and so uh, there's so much great energy going on. Um, and I was very lucky to find it in that lodge, I feel. Um, and that was, I've, I've visited other different lodges and I've, I've seen some, some who are very receptive and some who are a little bit more uh, trying to, to, to learn more about what's different. Um, but it's, but the spirit's there. Um, and I think, um, sorry, I'm trying to keep track of my, my thoughts here. Um, but I think what makes a Mason is changing. Um, a big, one of my favorite examples is in Capitol Hill, which is in Seattle, a place where there's a lot of, uh, I've got a lot of friends who are bartenders, door guys, uh, playing bands, other tattoo artists. And these are guys that, that, that you know, dress a certain way that looks a little more rough around the edges. But a, a group that I've known, how, like especially during the holiday season, like they, they get together blankets, they get together socks, they get together uh, meals, and they go out into the city and just hand them out to, to the homeless. Uh, there's there's uh, big, burly, metalhead guys that I know that are, that are really, uh, you know, anti-racism, anti, -racism, anti and, and very much, some of the nicest people you'll ever know, and they've made great masons. Um, and I think this is this is, you know, it's a window into some, to a larger world. Uh, and I think masons, while there's some growing that, that is happening right now, 
I'm excited to see the numbers grow from people coming from different walks of life. And how much uh, would you say is a matter of, I guess, how, how would uh, you, you approach those different walks of life in the sense that, you know, fr Freemasons are infamous or famous, depending on your point of view, for not, um, for not soliciting, for not quote unquote recruiting. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, I've talked to some other guys about, you know, every, every kind of Mason tries to find that line between, you know, improper solicitation versus, you know, being a, a beacon for the craft and just talking about it as opposed to trying to, but when you're, when you're looking at perhaps trying to cast a wider net or involve men who may have, you know, not known about Masonry in the past or not quote unquote typical Mason, typical space, I guess, do you, do you view that there's a room for, for, you go to those places, do you, should Masons advertise or, or how would you view about trying to find maybe groups of men or people that traditionally won't have joined a lodge? Or is it just like in your case, just focus on, you know, the luck of you having to find a Fez and a brother approach you about it and just go from there? Or do you think there's room for more coordinated efforts? Coordinated efforts, I mean, I've seen, like Grand Lodge put out a, a commercial for masonry, which, which was really great. It actually features a tattoo shop uh, that's run by a few masons uh, over in Spokane. And so I think, yeah, ads like that, I think are, are definitely helping. Um, but as far as really getting the word out, word out and, and with the importance of making sure that you're talking with somebody who quality over quantity is very important. And I know that that's been something that Masons have been maybe struggling a little bit when it comes to numbers. Um, but I still think that that quality is still a very, very important. And I think part of that is still developing a conversation. That's still got to be the start of it. Um, and that begins with little things. I mean, I, how many times I've, I've been to a bar or a social event and people see the rings that I have and I've got my square and compass right there. And that that's a conversation starter. Um, I'm not, I don't want to promote getting a tattoo of a square and compass, but, uh, I know I've tattooed some brothers, just, uh, tattooed square and compasses on them and they've been real big starters, but ultimately what it has to do is be is who we are as Masons inspiring others to want to do the same work. And to be honest, not even if they, not even push them to be Masons, but to just inspire people to, to do good works. And I think naturally, as that progresses and people see that by example, they're going to want to know more about masonry and they're going to want to have questions. But also, this also leads into another thing which we've had discussions in our lodge about as well, which is talking about being a mason. What does it mean for us? And right now, especially with, you know, the fact that we're men only is, is a big uh I think it needs a good solid answer for people who are curious why we're men only. Um, I personally believe that uh, I think it's a, a good source for us to back, uh, throw back and forth questions that we might not be able to ask those who are not men. And we can share perspectives so that we can motivate ourselves to be the best men we can be to be when we go out into the world. I'm never gonna know what it's like to be a woman. That's just a fact. And so maybe I can talk with another brother about any curiosities I've got or they vice versa. We can, we can share perspectives based on what we've been through. I was raised by a midwife and I think I've got a perspective on that, that I, that I'm very proud to have and very thankful for, but it's also uh, a perspective that I've never had to think about as a man, but I can share that with my brethren. And, and when we go out into the world, we now have that knowledge. Um, but that's a, it can be a touchy subject because again, like that's a lot of people don't might, might be a little sensitive to the fact that we're men only. But again, I think evolving what it means to be a Mason so that we can share that with others with pride and with, with open arms for anybody who has curiosity about it, I think that's very important. How do you, um, you know, approach the, I, I like what, I like, it, it kind of goes into what you talked about before at the start, you talked about 
know, it's a thinking man's lodge, it's about sharing perspectives. And mm -hmm. then, you know, a group of men are gonna be able to share perspectives, can learn from each other in, in a certain way, right? Communication with each other is just different depending on the group of people you have in the room. So how do you approach, um, you know, gathering perspectives? Like as a, as a worshipful master, you talked earlier about you have a presentation connecting the working tools of a mason to your tools as a tattoo artist. So it's like, do you approach other, when you're talking to other masons, do you approach them, talk about what they do for a living, their families, or is it just a matter of, you know, whatever they're comfortable sharing? I think it's, it starts with, with what they're comfortable sharing, um, but also making sure that you, you project an open, um, an open attitude. Um, and I think that that's, that can be, that, that takes experience. It takes uh, practice really. Um, I think it, I, I liken it with, I worked a lot of jobs growing up. I had anything I had a curiosity about, I took a job and I worked in construction, worked at a motorcycle shop, uh, worked as a cook, sign painter, but did a bunch of different jobs. Well, one thing that I was really happy about that is I got to be around different kinds of people. And you can see one way of talking with one person isn't the same as talking with another person. You can sometimes see, notice that you, what you project can communicate how you're going to receive. And that's important for a lot of, bro a lot of prospective brothers who are, might be a little apprehensive about whether or not they'd be accepted, uh, whether it be their sexual orientation, their ethnicity, uh, what they what they do for work or what kind of lifestyle they have i think those are things that that it's not we don't have a list of what you should and shouldn't do i think it has more to do with who you are at your core and so should those things matter i don't think so i think they 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 um they enhance who you are the conversation you have and how open you are to that so that they feel welcome that's where you get to learn. That's when you get to, to, to learn a perspective. Um, and yeah, of course, having the balance too of not being pushy about it or like jumping into someone's business and being like, who are you? What do you do? Tell me all about yourself. But just letting things kind of like learn how to let things go naturally. And how do you, do you think there's a, a proper way to like, like some guidelines as to how to suss that out? I'm thinking especially for, people who are interested, men who are interested, or, or an applicant. I know our Grand Lodge a few years ago um, came out with uh, kind of recommendations as to how to approach applicants. And the big thing was not, um, not immediately sponsoring them or, you know, not rushing them through, but they suggested, you know, you, you take a few months to get to know them, invite them to social functions, before you start the quote unquote official application process, because yeah. there was concern that, that we weren't taking enough time to get to know our applicants and we're having people come through who maybe weren't going to, it wasn't gonna be for them. And they were yeah. actually gonna end up not, because um, everything's not for everybody, but masonry is not for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess you, you talked about this earlier in terms of you know welcoming new applicants in, how do you find that balance between, you know, being welcoming and perhaps not being too eager or over eager to bring them in without kind of doing your homework and making sure it's the right fit for them and they're the right fit for the lodge? Um, I, I think having have, maybe having a checklist of what it is you're looking for in somebody pre-planned, I think is important. I think that's, that's one thing I like. I think a lot of lodges have that, um, but taking time, that's the important part. Um, yeah, you can have somebody visit a lodge and then give them a, a petition right then and there, but you haven't gotten to know them. And then if it doesn't work and you discover something about them later on, I don't think it takes much to really figure out an energy if you give it the proper amount of time. That Yeah, that means showing up to more than a few dinners. It means uh, helping out with volunteer work um, and getting to know the person. Um, there's, I mean, we do, we, we do get a questionnaire on the, on the petition. Doesn't mean we can't ask those questions before they even see a petition. Uh, and maybe going over what questions you want to ask this person. Like that, that's, I think a, a good 
point of as far as knowing how to talk to somebody who might be willing, willing to come in, something's got to kind of change a little bit. Maybe instead of uh, do you have a girlfriend or wife, do you have a partner? Do you have a support person? What do you do for a living? That's great. And, and also being able to say, like, I've never heard of that. Tell me more. Really showing genuine interest in whether you have an, uh, like a team that, that welcomes welcome somebody in or you, you kind of release them out into, <laughs> into the lodge for everybody to, to vet and look at, still maintaining what the expectation is and being able to communicate with your lodge that, hey, if we want to grow, we have to grow inside as well if we're going to grow in perspective and welcome that in. How, I, I, I'm not sure what the, the rules are in, in Seattle. Uh, this is just my own hobby horse. So I don't speak for any, any Mason mm -hmm. uh, or a Grand Lodge certainly, but one area that you know, I become frustrated with, but I'm not sure what the solutions are. Um, I don't know if you have any just thoughts, not solutions, but just ideas on mm -hmm. it. You know, you'll always hear, um, you know, work, family, then masonry, or family work, then masonry. Uh, that's in the, you're told Ontario a lot. And I think that was one thing it worked well, or that idea worked well in the 50s and in the 20s when you had so many men in lodge that you could lose, you know, 30, 40% of your membership, not lose in terms of become not members, but lose in terms of they're not attending large or doing work because you had so many that everybody else could pick up the slack. But even though numbers are growing, they're not growing nearly comparable to what they were before. And more and more we're struggling with, um, or I think everywhere, everywhere, at least in my experience is struggling with, you know, you get a member, but then maintaining that member through children, through work commitments, through family life two-income households, which means it's harder to get childcare and things of that nature. I, you know, do you, I'm very much of the opinion that we should be telling guys at the application stage or at the interest stage, you know, there is time commitments here. If you are not going to be able to do this because work or family life is going to become so big, you can always join later. So I think, at least I can speak for myself, it can be frustrating to admit a guy, he becomes a member and then you don't see him for, you know, years at it, you know, years and years. Yep. Then everybody else picks up the, I guess, do you, do you think we should be encouraging a time commitment to masonry? Or do you think it's more important to just have them be a member, have them pay their dues, and they can always come later, so long as they're paying those dues through that time? I, I think that statement right there is, where, uh, is something to reflect on. Um, is that the way you want to view your lodge? and the members of your lodge. Um, it would be nice if we grew <laughs> with the numbers that have been there before, absolutely. I don't believe they're there, um, not, not the capacity that they were. Like, um, I think they have potential, I, I, the growth is happening for sure. Um, but also what the division of time that's available in, in someone's life is not the same that it used to be either. Um, and I think that's, that's going to have to be for lodges to evolve. Um, I know that we're very lucky also to have a uh, daylight lodge uh, in a different part of Seattle that they hold their meetings at 11 a.m. or 10 a.m. Either way, it's ridiculously early in the morning, but it's 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 for brothers who you know that's the time that they're free because maybe they work uh, a bartender job or a different kind of job where they're working through the night and they can't make a meeting that's at six or seven o'clock in the in the uh, in the after in the evening um so little things like that are part of it but also understanding that that the growth isn't going to happen you know like that but understanding it's we could yeah we could push people through and get their petition signed and get them signed on and, and maybe see if they show up um and yeah the the numbers will be there but then what does that do for the lodge? What does that do for the growth of the lodge? Um, if a brother can't make it to every single meeting, but they're very vested into it and they want to be a part of it and share. And every time that they are, there's something that they're really giving to the lodge. I think they still deserve that opportunity and understanding from our end, as far as their availability and what they can really put forth. Um, 
but you're, you're going to find, I think you're going to find, yeah, for every, I don't know, maybe 10 brothers you got, you get two that are really devoted, really in there. Um, but just having a realistic perspective as far as, you know, what's coming in and what you can bring into the lodge. Yeah, that's, I guess that's always, that's one of my, my, you know, Masonic struggles is the, how realistic can you, you be? I mean, for, for myself, right, I don't have a, a family I'm flexible with work or whatever, so I can make the time. But, you know, if you're, for example, on an investigating committee and you're investigating a brother who's got, you know, a, a wife with a baby on the way and they work shift work, I mean, do you want to, maybe they really want to be a Mason, but the likelihood of them being able to attend lodge regularly might be up in the air. And then do you want to just bring them through if they you know, are going to be, I guess it's just, do you, do you think there should be time commits on, on being a Mason? Or do you think so long as they're a member, they can always find the time later, you know, once the family's grown and so long as we keep them. I think it's a discussion to have with the, with the, with the prospective brother. Um, what's their motivation? What do they want to do? Um, that also goes hand in hand with taking the time, having them show up to meetings and be like, okay, well, the, the minimum, even if you're not going to, if you're not going to become an officer, the minimum is at least once a month. If they can make that happen, then great. That's good. They can make it to a meeting and maybe their, their, um, the contribution to the lodge is, is more like what we're doing now, more over zoom or more over like communication or doing some like we have a brother who does a lot of research and we see him every so often, but every time he comes, he has a ton to share. Um, it's that's a conversation to have with, you know, with the brother themselves, with, with the potential brother themselves. Uh, what do they want to give? What, is, what can they give? Um, I think as far as expecting a commitment of time, officers, absolutely. Officers need to know what they're getting into so that, that so that they can do their job to keep the lodge running. As far as a brother who may only be able to make it to the meetings, I think they should have the opportunity to do that. Um, and again, if they communicate their investment that they want to be into it. I see, uh, we'll switch topics a bit because I see behind you, you got uh, Stranger Things, it looks like. Oh, yeah. I, uh, I've done a few few podcasts, but do you have any, just curious, do you have any, any, um, movies or, or any type of media that depicts Freemasonry that you uh that you enjoy I've done if you know we got the Simpsons Stonecutters episode <laughs> yeah. um, I want to say I did I did see something recently I, I, for the life of me I can't I know there's a there's a cartoon called Gravity Falls uh, that has a ton of Masonic imagery sprinkled all over the place I mean like one of the main characters grandpa wears a fez and the symbol on the top isn't exactly, you know, what our fezes have, but it is so ridiculously close that you can tell whoever's behind it is like just throwing these things out there to get people to, any Mason who watches it definitely gets something out of it for sure. Um, but yeah, no, I'm trying to think. Um, not that I can, not off the top of my head. Um, do you usually yeah. go for like the the sci? You've got Stranger Things, so do you normally go for the sci-fi horror? Route? Like, what's your what's your preferred preferred genre? Uh, I mean, it, it kind of jumps around a bit. Um, that's actually my my girlfriend's son's comic sitting up there uh, that they got. But I I love the artwork, and we actually we just watched it with them, and he really digs it. But yeah, uh, sci-fi fantasy. Um, big Star Wars fan since I was a kid. Um, Is that where your kind of uh, some of your, your inspiration for the tattooing side of things come? Like when you're, when you're designing a tattoo, you mentioned you love the artwork in Stranger Things. Do you, do you crib a lot from media, even from masonry? Like where do you get your, your ideas for designs? Uh, it's, it's kind of a, the great thing with tattooing is you do a ton of different designs and uh, done different kinds of art with what people bring in. So you really, you really build your palette as far as uh, inspiration. Uh, Freemasonry definitely, drives into that uh i've done some some uh freemason designs that i've been pretty stoked on that kind of they get creative with uh, a lot of japanese artwork 
uh, from old Japanese tattooing, which I learned about a lot as, uh, when I was younger. Um, uh, but yeah, there's, there's all sorts of stuff out there, really. Um, uh, you mentioned um, yeah. <laughs> a, a Masonic tattoo shop in Spokane. What's that? You mentioned that there's a, a Masonic tattoo shop in Spokane, I think it was. Yeah, Spokane. Uh, there is uh, Caleb out there runs uh, on the level ink or on the level tattoo, I believe. Um, let me double check here. Um, yeah, it's a it's a shop. There's also another one uh, in Mar uh, Marysville called uh, Lion's Paw Tattoo. <laughs> and then uh, actually, no, uh, Worshipful, uh, Worshipful Brother Keith Bailey runs Anvil Tattoo, uh, which I just, I'm going to check those out. That's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I got, let's see if I can somehow show this off. I got, let's see if this works. I don't edit anything either. So this is going to be a very, <laughs> there we go. You kind of see my scoring compass. I got a whole bunch. Me and a few yeah. Masonic buddies all went, uh, then I got Don Quixote down here with some Masonic symbolism. Oh, very cool. Me and some buddies always go every year and get, uh, updated Masonic tattoos. Yes, on the level tattoo run by Caleb Frey. On the level tattoo. All right, I'm going to check that out. That'd be a good, make a cool podcast. How yeah, much, absolutely. Uh, do you have, I'm not, I'm not very good at uh, kind of the geography of, uh, of the state is, are they close to you guys? Do you guys collaborate at all with your, um, your, with your tattoo shop, which was called again, Oh, uh, Handsome Devil Inc. in Renton. Uh, so my shop is, or the shop that I work at is, I would say about 15 minutes south of Seattle. Uh, Spokane is actually on the other side of Washington, uh, more towards Idaho. And then the other two shops, uh, Lion's Paw Tattoo and Anvil are, I'd say about 30 minutes north of Seattle. How close are you guys to the, um, yeah, you guys in particular, close to uh, the border to uh, BC? Uh, I think it's probably about two, two and a half hours from Seattle to the border. Uh, I think. Um, so, yeah, whatever that would be minus or so, the, yeah, that minus about 30 minutes from the other two shops that are north. Cool. I was just wondering if you ever had a chance to visit any uh, any Canadian lodges. Uh, not yet. Our sister lodges, although, is in Vancouver and our Tyler, actually, brother uh, uh, Andrew is is up there. And fortunately, he's. He's been stuck up there during all the quarantine and stuff because they closed the border. Uh, but as soon as that opens, one of our plans does, is to go up there and go visit that lodge. Um, nice. But I personally haven't been able to go up there yet. Keep uh, once, once knock on wood, it's soon. Once everything calms down, let me uh, keep in touch. Let me know when you guys cross over. I'd love to have you back on to talk about your visit. Because Oh, that'd be great. Yeah. I love, uh, you know, being in Windsor. Windsor is right on the, the border, right at the river to Detroit. So again before march uh there was always masons going back and forth uh visiting you know ontario brethren visiting michigan lodges and michigan lodges visiting ontario even we go to ohio so i definitely miss my uh, american brethren i always enjoy getting a chance to to cross over the bridge and see some guys in livonia or detroit or anything like that have you uh how you know, with the, with the virtual happy hours, um, I guess, how have you found the inability to, to travel and visit other lodges? Are you making it up through the happy hours? Because um, I think that's the biggest thing that, that we're missing in Masonry outside of physically meeting is physically traveling to other lodges. Absolutely. Um, yeah. I mean, like I said before, like my original plan was to be going to different lodges and and giving this talk that I put together. Um, but yeah, so with the Zoom meetings and the, the virtual happy hours, there's, it's not going face to face. It's not actually traveling to a different land, but you're actually, we're meeting people we never thought we would. Um, like the fact that you showed up at our meeting was really awesome. And we get to meet brothers that aren't, are, are out of state or out of country. That's, that's something I don't think we would have done had it not been for the restrictions that Corona had created. So it was definitely an opportunity to grow. And while it might not be exactly what we want, 
I think it is, it is an amazing use of the technology to still grow and, and connect with brothers outside of our lodge. Yeah. I, I, you know, the, every crisis an opportunity, right. In this case, yeah, definitely op- same thing with me and opportunities to connect with brethren. I not, I, I wouldn't have otherwise, if not for, well, first of all, for Facebook, for, for social media, getting the invitations and keeping up to date mm-hmm. and then zoom and all the technology that comes with it. Yeah. You guys, um, I know that your lodge, if I recall correctly, when I looked on your website, it said that you guys were founded in 1904. Yes. Yeah, and I think I misquoted earlier. It wasn't 1908, 1904. Yes. And then amalgamated with, with other lodges in the area. Uh, did, did you look, one thing I'm curious and I'm asking about, have you looked at any of your, I know I'll be talking to Adam next, next week, Mm-hmm. Any of your records about kind of you, University Lodge or Freemasonry in Seattle during the last pandemic, 1918 through 1920? I know that we have all of our minute books. Um, we are we have three three floors in our building, and the third one uh, we have a library as well as probably about three rooms full of just old text, old mit book mit, uh, minute books. Um, so I know we've got it out there. I don't think we've, we haven't had a chance to go in and, and scour through it. I do know that is a goal to, to go in and see what historically we can find uh, from the last pandemic that was happening. Um, I did, uh, we have talked, we have talked about that. Cause again, like masonry has been through something similar to this before but without the technology and they still made it through. And I think that that's, that's something very important to look at. Um, we may not be able to have our lodges but we, but what brothers before us have I've gone through this before and still kept lodges alive. And I think that that's, uh, that's very motivating. You know what? I can be a bit of a pessimistic person and I really like that optimistic statement. And I think that's a, a good place to end it for now, but I definitely want to keep in touch because I'd love to learn, you know, how things are going in Seattle. Once everything is resolved, you know, your visits um, mm-hmm. to not just Vancouver, but, you know, just see how your, your lodge is growing and hopefully one day I can make it down to the, uh, I'd love to make it down to the West Coast one day. That'd be great. We'd love to have you. <laughs> awesome. Well, so next week it'll be uh, Adam Alsobrook. And thank you so much again for, for taking the time to, to talk with me. This is, you know, the, the lockdowns and the suspension of, of our meetings. It's given me the chance to, like you said, connect with brethren I wouldn't connect with otherwise, including worshipful brother Ben Stagner. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. All right. And um, I should have checked before the virtual happy hours or the, the virtual meets, are they still going to be going on? Uh, so what we're, we're trying to do them at least uh, the third Monday of the month, uh, whether it be a happy hour or a talk that we put together, a presentation. Uh, but we try to have something at least the third Monday and we will post it on uh, proud to be a Mason on Facebook, grumpy past masters on Facebook. And I believe that's it. And possibly there's a tattoo one, but I can't remember the name of it right now. Is there uh, an email that if uh, a Mason is interested, they can contact? Uh, yes. Uh, if you go to our website, uh, look up university lodge 141 Seattle. We do have a website that you can find the contact info there. Uh, our secretary is worshipful or, is uh, Brother Matthew Livingston. Uh, he'd be the guy to contact. Or if you find any one of us on Facebook, feel free to hit, hit me up or anybody else who's a brother. We can always make sure we get the info out there. And I will, if you look down in the comments section, down that way, I will uh, throw your um, throw your website in the, uh, in the description of this video. So I appreciate that. Brother watching can check that out. Thank you so much. I very much appreciate your time. Thank you.